So it's a, it's a pleasure to uh, introduce Paul Fuchek from the uh, UBI uh, EMBL Instant Campus. And um, Paul, actually, I forgot to ask you, how many years you've been there? Uh, just more than 10. More than 10. Okay. More than 10 years he's been there. And so he has passed the, uh, the uh, required uh, nine year clock that many UBI folks or EMBL staff are, are faced with. So he's, he's at the point. Uh, employee there, so it's good for him. And um, so uh, Paul did his uh, P his undergrad, sorry, in physics at uh, in uh, at uh, Drake University in um, Iowa, and he is from Minnesota, <coughs> so he doesn't have a UK accent yet, although he's been there more than ten years. Or some people claim you do have a UK accent. I th I think. It doesn't sound quite right. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I actually get asked if I'm Canadian pretty regularly. <laughs> so, Canadian is the, the apparently to the, Americans uh, that's the version of, of American that doesn't sound right. Yeah. <laughs> and um, at the EBI, um, since uh, I guess I actually I have that written down since 2005, he's been uh, involved with a number of genome resources, ensemble, and so forth. But today he's going to talk to us about some of his research activities. So he has a research group and, and present on the uh, evolutionary wiring. So please uh, uh, join me in welcoming Paul to Toronto once again. <laughs> we also have a so he gets to visit us from time to time. Actually, Toronto is one of my favorite cities. And I, I commonly tell people who ask me where I'm from because they're, they're geographically challenged. You know, where are you from? Well, from St. Paul, Minnesota, about 150 miles north of Toronto. <laughs> and they can sort of figure that out on their own. South of Toronto. North of Toronto. North of Toronto. Yeah. 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 <laughs> St. Paul sits on the 45th. Uh, oh, yeah. 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 Well, right. north of you guys. <laughs> anyway, so uh, today I'm going to talk about some of the research that my group does. My research group is completely computational, completely dry, but unlike some other bioinformatics research groups that may be motivated by developing algorithms, I've always been motivated by discovery biology to understand what the biology is really telling us and rather than using experimental techniques, to use computational techniques. So fortunately, I've been able to have establish a long-term collaboration with an experimental group at the University of Cambridge, with Duncan Odom's group. And uh, some of the things that we've studied over that time include the evolution of transcriptional regulation. Now, transcriptional regulation is a very complex process. And in fact, it's a process that many groups spend a lot of time studying because of its complexity. I've kind of drawn out this, uh, uh, this diagram here, and I'll show you the areas that we're going to focus on for this talk. So just to highlight to you, the gene goes off this way. Um, we have this promoter here. Uh, here's the RNA polymerase. And this whole collection of little pink blobs are transcription factors that bind in the promoter region and basically turn the gene on, control it, uh, control it, and start the transcription, which eventually will lead to the protein. Now there's a couple of other uh, points of this diagram. There's these uh, there's these regions of the genomes up here that are called enhancers. These also bind transcription factors. They interact with the main promoter uh, to help modulate the transcription. Over here on this side is another protein. It's called CTCF. Uh, CTCF binds, does all sorts of things. As it, it sets up and controls how the genome is structured. Uh, it's commonly called an insulator, but it in fact does many other things. So we're going to be concentrating mostly on things like enhancers and on transcription factor binding sites and how they evolve. So I mentioned transcriptional regulation is an incredibly complex process. There's uh, an important law in biology as to how to understand complex processes. And that's use evolution if you can. Uh, as, of course, uh, this quote, which many people bring up, nothing in biology makes sense in the light of evolution. So we do use evolution to try to understand transcriptional regulation. And in fact, take an explicit evolutionary approach. There's a number of good reasons to do this. So I, I've mentioned already that transcriptional regulation is, is incredibly complex. And in fact, it's, it's layered. Many layers over and over uh, provide redundancy uh, and produce the, the final transcriptional output. Transcriptional regulation also uh, is responsible for the great magic, I think, of biology, which is how the same genome in every cell in our body produces all of these wild tissues that do all these different things with very different cell types and very different processes. Evolution also uh, reflects the history of the genome, the evolutionary history of it. And when we use comparative analysis, it gives us a window 
through the path that evolution actually took from a common ancestor. So evolution has done experiments for us, and we need to help to interpret that. And of course, if you do any analysis in genomics, uh, the data is going to be informed by evolution in one way or another, either by evolutionary constraint, or by orthologs, or by something else. So I'd like to point out that uh, comparative methods um, are not something new. Uh, in fact, comparative anatomy goes back a long way. Uh, this is an example of mammalian fore and hind limb, fore limbs and hind limbs. Uh, from the top it goes uh, for the, the fore limbs, human, dog, pig, sheep, and horse. Obviously there's very strong similarities. Over here with the hands, these are uh, human down here, but then alligator, turtle, and salamander. And obviously there's very strong similarities. And using comparative anatomy was a, a very important way to understand how the body worked. Now, I show this slide all the time. It's from uh, Francis. Uh, genomes work the same way. Uh, in 1972, Jacques Monod famously said, uh, what's true for E. coli is true for the elephant. Uh, now, of course, he said that in French. So it took the Americans 16 years to get that translated. <laughs> so I, I was wondering, that no one laughs when I tell that joke in the United States. Everyone <laughs> laughs when I tell that joke in Europe. So uh, I'm learning how that works. Uh, but, but of course, this, this is fundamentally true. We can learn these fundamental things and have learned fundamental things across species. But biology is becoming more and more information and indeed a sequence-based science. And here again, uh, this comparative analysis tells us a lot. Up at the top, I've uh, used the same species that we saw the, the four limbs, so human and, and so on. This is hemoglobin. It's no surprise that hemoglobin is highly conserved. It's one of the most important proteins that we have, and it does one of the most important jobs. When we look down across the human and the, uh, the reptiles, again, we see this very strong similarity. And in fact, it's this similarity that has been known well before we started sequencing genomes that gave us a lot of idea about how the genome regulation was going to look uh, when we started to find conservation. Because the protein coding genes are highly conserved. And, and across species like the mammals, most of the genes are the same. They're fundamentally the same. The biggest differences between most mammals is the number of olfactory receptors that we have, your sense of smell. Otherwise, most of the genes are the same. So this, this process actually led to a whole host of assumptions that justified why we sequenced many of the other genomes that we did. Uh, and these assumptions were built on initial studies that looked at very highly conserved genes and highly conserved pathways, including the beta globin locus. Uh, and the idea, which came out in, in a number of different ways, basically said that if we sequence all of these genomes, we already know the algorithms, we can line them up, we're going to find all the regulatory regions, there's going to be some regions that are conserved, those are the genes, some other regions that are conserved, those are going to be the regulatory regions, job done, we move on to something else. Now, of course, biology is not that easy when you start to collect data, uh, but I do want to, to point out this, one of my favorite quotes. This is from a, a review that Stephen O'Brien wrote in 1999. Because this one actually turned out to be true. Not the way he wrote it, uh, necessarily. But the things that we can do now, that we can sequence any species that we want, and, and do functional genomics on any species that we want, does give us a way to, to extend things further than we really ever thought. So there's a couple of common assumptions about evolutionary conservation. And these are common assumptions because they're at least partly true. Uh, so if something is important, it will be conserved. Uh, tissue level functions are conserved uh, in, in most vertebrate species, definitely in mammalian species. And functional DNA sequence, uh, uh, generally, many people assume that it must be conserved. If it's functional, it's conserved. And then there's a corollary to this uh, that now people know is not formally true, uh, but many people still believe which is that higher conservation is proportional to higher importance. Uh, and when we model DNA sequence evolution, we fundamentally use a, a single model uh, to look at things. And that model was learned on protein-coding <coughs> genes and the way codons themselves evolve. Now, of course, some of these uh, assumptions about conservation simply can't be true. Because if only, if functional DNA and conserved DNA are exactly the same thing, we must look like mice. And so the functional DNA in the genome is a combination of that, the, that part that's evolutionary conserved and that part that's lineage specific. 
In fact, it can be no other way. So the question that we have is to figure out what is the fraction that's evolutionarily conserved and what is the fraction that's lineage specific. We actually don't know the answer to that, but, but that's really the question we need to focus on. So I need to, before I go on, I need to say that not everyone kind of agreed with these approaches. And in fact, Manolo Sturmansakis and Andy Clark uh, really kind of hit the nail on the head. These data indicate that the conserved fraction of the genome may be substantially smaller than the functional fraction. They got this, but they didn't know what it was. They, they couldn't determine what these two uh, fractions of the genome were. We still don't know the answer to that. Um, but we've set out uh, since this point to really try to collect the data to answer this question. We still haven't done it, but we've tried to collect the data. One of the, the goals of the ENCODE project in 2003 was to systematically do this, collect lots of data and sequence a large collection of mammals. This was in code one, the pilot project. In code two, uh, really focused just on the human genome and the whole genome. In code three, continues the project. But it's really about addressing these, this uh, distinction between uh, what are these two, what is the, the functional fraction of the genome. Uh, there were, of course, other experiments uh, and new mammalian genome sequences that brought uh, a number of insights. My favorite of these insights, um, for a number of reasons, is the ultra-conserved regions. So back in 2005, when the rat genome was, was finished sequencing, there was a comparison. And really, actually shocking to many people was this roughly 500 regions of the genome that were 100% identical in human, mouse, and rat, and also present in these other species, the more highly conserved than proteins. And if you use that assumption that higher conservation is somehow proportional to higher importance, these must be incredibly important regions of the genome. The most, maybe you could argue the 500 most important regions of the genome. And so, uh, in a classic experiment, um, Eddie Rubin's lab, and, and, and Nadav, who's, who's just a great guy, you know when, when they proposed this project for his postdoc project, this was a slam dunk. I mean, they were going to have a great, and, but of course, they did the experiment, and nothing happened. They knocked out these, these highly conserved regions, and they, 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 they set it out to get a phenotype. They knocked out the ones that were really likely to cause problems, and they didn't get anything. So that's where we are. Things are complicated. Evolutionary conservation is complex when we look across the genome using models that were built on protein coding genes. So how can we start to pick this apart? We started to do experiments. Actually, Duncan Odom started to do these when he was a, a postdoc, and we've continued them over the last seven years. Uh, to really do the experiments and understand how transcriptional regulation is evolving. There's a few fundamentals that we've picked up uh, that are now uh, essentially universal. One, mammalian transcription factor binding locations evolve rapidly. They're moving all the time. We did a number of experiments. We've looked at a number of uh, transcription factors. We've looked at about 40 species. Uh, this is just uh, an example of a couple of them. Two different tissue-specific transcription factors, CBP-alpha and HNF4-alpha. These are different in a number of ways. One, uh, CBP-alpha is non-essential, so if you knock it out of the mouse, the mouse is mostly fine. HNF4-alpha, different story. Knock it out of the mouse, the mouse doesn't survive. Uh, we've also looked at uh, ubiquitously expressed. So as opposed to uh, restricted expression, these tissue-specific factors, we've looked at ubiquitously expressed DNA binding proteins. CTCF is the primary example. It's expressed in basically every tissue of the body. Um, we do our experiments in liver uh, for a variety of technical and, and practical reasons. Uh, and we're always looking at highly conserved transcription factors because we need the antibodies when we do chip seek to work in all of the species that we're looking at. This is what the raw data looks like. Uh, Mike Wilson, who's sitting up here in the front, uh, is that Mike Wilson. Uh, and was involved in, in some of these studies when he was a postdoc in Duncan's so let's zoom in on this, uh, this raw data picture. This is an example uh, going from human, mouse, dog, opossum, and chicken, where a transcription factor, here CBP-alpha, so this liver-specific um, uh, but non-essential transcription factor, is binding in the same location at the 5' prime end of the PCK1 gene uh, over 300 million, from 300 million years ago when the, the humans and the chickens shared a common ancestor. This is uh, a striking event that shows critical conserved regulation. But more often, we see situations like this, where 
there are peaks in some species and they're missing in others. So we set out to classify these using a simple, uh, a, a simple diagram where we just put a colored circle if it was bound in that species and an open circle if it wasn't. Then we could look across all combinations. And what we see is that these ultra-shared events, like that one that was in front of the PCK1 gene, are incredibly rare. Uh, so 35 times they show up. This is out of approximately 30,000 binding sites in these, in these various species. So one-tenth of one percent do we see these ultra-conserved regions. Now again, humans and chickens share many thousands of genes that are one-to-one -one orthologs. Human and chicken liver actually look pretty similar under the microscope. But key aspects of the regulation are not conserved. And even if we look at placental specific uh, regulation, we don't see the type of conservation that you might expect uh, from the functional conservation of the liver, and indeed the conservation of the gene expression profiles that exist at revolutionary time. CTCF is a different story. Uh, so unlike these tissue specific factors, CTCF, which is expressed in basically every tissue, shares many uh, binding sites across species. There's about 5,000 across this collection of uh, placental mammals. If you look at closely related mammals, like human and macaque or mouse and rat, you see 60% or more uh, of the sites are in the same place uh, between those species. So one other aspect of the fundamentals. Uh, binding sites of different factors have fundamentally different modes of evolution. So they're, they're not evolving the same way. And it might not be appropriate to even use the same model to think about how they're evolving. I'll give you some examples from these same factors. HNF4-alpha and CBP-alpha, these two tissue-specific factors, uh, their binding sites are apparently created and lost by small-scale sequence changes. So these blue and little orange bars uh, represent uh, the, um, the losses due to either a few mismatches, so sequence variants, or small indents. And those dominate these situations for both HNF4-alpha and CBP-alpha. You can see there's a, there's a number of cases where the motif isn't changed and we still have binding loss. We'll actually explore that in a little more detail later on. Interestingly, uh, when we lose one of these binding sites, in a situation where it still exists in the other of these two species, so say it's lost in human but it still exists in mouse and dog, where that would give you a parsimonious explanation that it was present in the common ancestor, how often we see that recovered is only less than 50% of the time. So these sites that are so important that they're preserved down two lines, uh, but lost in the third, are apparently not that important after all. Uh, they can be lost without recovery. CTCF is a little bit of a different story. Uh, CTCF binding changes are driven by retrotransposon invasion. Uh, so we discovered this, and in fact, the only way I think you could prove this is by an informatics analysis. We discovered this by looking not at the motif. When you look at the motif and the, the various uh, percentages of the factor or the letters that are used in the motif are identical. But when you look at the exact DNA sequence, the exact sequence word, so to speak, you see the striking difference. There's a series of words that basically only show up in mouse and rat, another series that only shows up in dog, and another group that only shows up in opossum. And these words are indicative of repeat structures in the genome. And as it turns out, the mouse rat and rat ones are from the B2 repeat, which spread through the rodent genome uh, before and just after the mouse rat speciation. Uh, another repeat, a completely separate repeat in the dog genome, and, and still another separate repeat in the monodelphus genome. Now the interesting thing uh, is that this repeat in all of these shares two characteristics. One, it's based on the lysine TRN. So it, it's, it's a retrotransposon that captured a lysine tRNA. And this lysine tRNA has been captured many times as a retrotransposon throughout uh, evolutionary history. Two, it contains a near-perfect CTCF binding site. And so as these retrotransposons spread through the genome, they spread CTCF binding sites with them. And these CTCF binding sites work just like all the other CTCF binding sites in the genome, um, meaning that this retrotransposon remodels the genome uh, with CTCF. Okay, so some of the fundamentals. We were interested in really understanding what was happening. Uh, we've looked at, we looked at species with these very long branch lines. Human and mouse separated roughly 80 million years ago. That's 160 million years of evolution between those two species. 
lots of things change in 160 million years. So can we get some insight into how things are changing in a much shorter situation? We did this with a series of five mice. So uh, C57 black 6 and AJ are two common laboratory strains. And then we stepped out by evolutionary time with Musk Castaneus, Musk Spratus, and Musk Caroli. Musk Caroli and, and Musk Muscula shared a common ancestor roughly four to six million years ago. Uh, and that makes the total branch length throughout this entire clade 16 million years. Uh, so an order of magnitude less than just the human and mouse distance. And we had to sequence Musk Caroli specifically to do this study, uh, which at the time seemed amazing and honestly kind of still seems amazing now. Uh, but this allows us to analyze uh, not just the evolution of the binding sites themselves, but the evolution of the binding site intensity uh, between these species. So here, uh, we did really the same experiment that we've done in these other cases. Uh, we looked at the transcription factors in different species using the same experimental setup. We took CBP alpha and HNF4 alpha, our two old friends that I talked about before, and added a third, FOXA1. Uh, and what you can see here, unlike the diagram I previously showed is a lot more of the peaks are the same. Now this shouldn't be a surprise. These animals are closely, closely evolutionarily related. But if you look closely, there are still a lot of differences. And we can quantify these differences. Uh, and we did this, actually. We had suspected from the earlier experiments that we were looking at an exponential decay of, of binding sites. So they were changing at an exponential rate. We could actually now put a, a, a number on it. We could put we could put the, the number on the exponent. And it turns out, uh, and again, this I think is kind of amazing, that the same decay rate occurs for all three transcription factors we looked at. For FOXA1, CDP alpha, and HNF4 alpha. Even though, empirically, the factors are of different importance. HNF4 alpha is, is fundamentally more important. Uh, but the, the binding sites change at the same rate. So this might represent a specific mode of evolution. This might just be how the liver evolves. This might be how tissue-specific regulation evolves. I don't really know the answer to that yet. But it's pretty striking that uh, this, this is the, the approach taken for these binding sites. And it's different than uh, just the, the, some simple sequence change analysis. And it's very different than the CTCF changes between these species. We looked in some detail at the genetic changes. Uh, and it quickly becomes apparent that simple sequence changes are, are not enough to explain what we see. So I think this is best shown down here, where we have a situation where we have uh, binding sites that are not shared between species, and here where they are shared between species. And you can see that uh, no SNP in the motif is colored dark. There's a SNP in the motif uh, if it's colored light. And it's not a surprise that there are more SNPs when we don't have sharing. But most of the time, uh, up to six million years, we have a situation where there is no SNP in the motif, but it's still been lost. So it's not just simply sequence changes in the motifs that are driving these, these changes in the binding site that we see. So what is? Well, there's a number of things. One is combinatorial binding. Uh, we were able to see that there is an effect, uh, or at least an apparent effect, of combinatorial binding. So whether a binding site is lost, or retained between two evolutionarily related species is partly dependent on whether it binds alone or with its friends. And that's, I think, best uh, described down here, where we see a situation with, with a cluster of all three of our transcription factors, HNF4-alpha, CBP-alpha, FOXA1. And the most common outcomes are all three of them stay together, or they're all gone. And what you would assume, based on any sort of random model, is these down here, where we have some partial loss. Uh, partial conserved, because we had to focus each of the analysis on a, on a single factor. Partial conserved or partial loss are really the same thing. Uh, but this represents a minority of the cases, even though randomly it should represent a, a lot more. And so when the clusters are lost, it's likely they all go together. Uh, suggests that there's some sort of co-evolution or, or combinatorial pattern. More than this, the binding intensities, uh, when they do change, they change uh, concordantly. They change coordinately. So we look at the situation where we have two factors uh, in two different species, and we see no matter which two factors we choose, correlated intensities. One shrinks, the other shrinks. That's the general situation. Uh, and so we see this very interesting thing where the binding sites are, are and the, the binding sites that we see and how evolution is working is working together. We're able to even uh, take a look at evolution, 
uh, intensity evolution by estimating the ancestral intensity and then estimating how often we see conserved evolution versus uh, random or some kind of progressive or, or monotonic evolution where the binding sites were slowly getting bigger or slowly getting smaller. Now it turns out that that slowly getting bigger, slowly getting smaller, uh, those sort of changes that move in line, that just never happens. One of two outcomes happens. The binding sites are conserved or they change randomly over evolutionary time. Uh, and that's, that's true whatever factor we're looking at. So what's going on? Well, so what we see looking at these short branch lines is that transcription factor binding sites that are conserved are conserved both at the level of intensity, which we saw co-varies, uh, and are more stable within a context of other binding partners. However, even knowing this, the binding sites are indeed lost very quickly, even over short evolutionary time. Between Musk musculus and Musk corolli, so four to six million years, 50% of the binding sites have changed places. And when this loss happens, it seems to encourage the loss of binding partners. So all of these suggest there's a model of coordinated and also rapid evolution of these transcription factor binding sites. We could get a little more insight into this by looking at uh, knockouts. So we have the genetic knockouts of CBP alpha, where the, the gene has been completely removed. We also have conditional knockouts of HNF4 alpha, which can be done with a Cree recombinase. And all of this, so once we redid all the chip experiments in these knockouts, uh, we had some experiments and internal control. So for the example of a CBP alpha knockout, we could look at all of the, the clusters that contain CBP alpha and compare it to the controls, the clusters that didn't contain CBP alpha and a CTCI chip. And what we do when we see this is that uh, the controls, so the, the FOXA1 and the HNF4-alpha uh, clusters, basically are at the inter-individual reproducibility rates, where any of the clusters that shared a, a CBP-alpha binding site, we see marked drops. So we found consistently that these combinatorial sites are destabilized when one of the binding partners is lost. And in fact, we could then look back and see this effect in evolution, where there were single SNVs that hit one of the high information content sites in these various motifs. It was often enough to eliminate the entire cluster. So all of this uh, actually was very interesting. But we then asked the question, what, if anything, does all of these changes in the transcription factors, especially the changes in intensity, do to the outcome of, of the gene expression? And the answer, uh, maybe initially surprising, is really not very much at all. Uh, so it's been well known that gene expression changes uh, much more slowly over evolutionary time than transcription factor binding. In fact, gene expression is, is largely conserved. When you look at any two species and cluster them, uh, you will see, if you do gene expression for many tissues and cluster it, you see the clusters by tissue always and by species. Uh, and so we, we saw basically the same thing. We see high expression correlation. We see lower binding correlation. And in fact, this persists. And we see a largely decoupled approach between, between the changes in the transcription factor binding intensity and the changes in the gene expression, except for a very specific class of genes, uh, which you could find in a completely orthogonal way and are commonly called target genes. So target genes, are, are the way we discovered them, the way many people do, is you do a knockout, and then you look for the genes that are differentially expressed above some threshold. You define those as target genes, and you say you're done. This is the only thing that that transcription factor affects. And so for these situations, uh, of the genes, there's about 10,000 in each case. We see 50, 70, 270 um, are the so-called target genes here. And for all of these, we see or for, for almost all of these, we see a coordinated uh, changes in the expression and the, and the transcription factor binding intensity. Uh, so what we interpret this to mean is that there is a very small number of genes, which have been historically called target genes, that are single transcription factor regulated genes. But in fact, most genes are regulated by many transcription factors. And so the idea that we can even use this term target gene, and it makes sense, I think, is, a, is problematic. Um, the redundancy that exists in the genome means that gene expression, and it's especially the evolutionary stability that we see, gene expression is better described by a group of 50 people pushing a car up a hill. 
You could pull out any one of those 50 people, and in fact, the car would still be pushed up the hill. And if you pulled one out, and then put that one back in, and pulled the second one out, and did this process over and over, you would come to the conclusion that every one of those 50 people were useless to pushing that car up the hill. That conclusion is completely wrong. And so when I see studies that knock down every transcription factor and announce that none of the binding sites are important, I think their model is wrong. I think, they, I think we don't yet understand the redundancy in the chain. But regardless, uh, when you look at this, the binding intensity is largely uncorrelated with expression changes. And I think that's because we see this redundancy, and the redundancy overpowers any effect we can see from a, a transcription factor. And the non-target genes are then more stable, and obviously so, uh, because we already define them as being not uh, single factor regular genes. Okay, so uh, what do we know about the first steps of regulatory evolution? We know that mammals have widespread quantitative differences between transcription factor binding, uh, even between closely related species. We know that these single nucleotide variants uh, near motifs are responsible for some differences, but other changes are apparently more important. Combinatorially bound regions show coordinate changes in a number of ways, and, and changes in binding intensity are, are directly reflected in gene expression in only a tiny number of cases. So what can we use all these evolutionary signals for? Uh, one of the things that we can do is to try to identify tissue-specific and disease-causing uh, disease variants. Uh, and this actually is, is a paper uh, that came out of Mike's lab and, and that, that we collaborated with him on, uh, doing multi-species, uh, uh, multi-factor chip seeking. So this was, four, or this was five species, four transcription factors. And all across the genome, you see these examples of dynamic evolutionary history with both conserved and lineage-specific binding sites, exactly as you would might expect uh, when you think about how much the transcription factor binding sites are changing. And this region here is one that you would expect to be incredibly highly conserved. The factor seven and factor 10 genes are associated with the clotting pathway, one of the most evolutionarily important things uh, that has ever been, been come across. Conserved regulation there, especially in the liver, should be through the roof, but in fact it's not. Uh, it, it's a dynamic part of the gene. What we do see when we look at this uh, is that functional conservation, so whether or not a binding site is shared in another species, is more important than binding intensity. Uh, and so no matter how we look at this, the, the regulatory regions that are shared functionally across species are more likely to mark liver-specific pathways, and in fact they're more likely to uh, mark important regions of disease uh, than, than regions sorted by peak intensity. It's not exactly clear why this is. So peak intensity, it's not even clear what that represents in a chip seek experiment. It might be the number of cells that are binding that peak, or binding that site, it might be something else. But regardless, it is more important if you observe that in a second species than if you just see an intense peak. We were also able to do something I think very cool, uh, which is to find a, the molecular cause of a specific rare disease. Uh, so this is hemophilia B. Leiden. Uh, hemophilia B is associated with disruptions to the factor IX <coughs> gene. Factor IX is on the X chromosome, so this hits men. Hemophilia B. Leiden is even more interesting because after puberty it goes away. Um, so there's some, there's some complete change to the way this, the promoter of this works after puberty. But regardless, these little triangles represent mutations that cause hemophilia. And it was known, it, the, these are regulatory mutations as well. Here's where the gene actually starts. And it was known for many years that there's two transcription factor binding sites, CBP alpha, HNF4 alpha, that get hit with these mutations and they cause hemophilia. But there were these two mutations here that also caused me, uh, hemophilia. People didn't know what that was. And they couldn't figure it out from traditional sequence-based comparative genomics, even though they had sequenced this promoter back in 1993 in all of these species. The reason they couldn't figure it out is because although they could see a perfectly conserved CBP alpha binding site and a perfectly conserved HNF4 alpha binding site, this region didn't look conserved at all. The reason it doesn't look conserved is because the binding site is shifted over by three base pairs, apparently by some ancestral indel in the mouse rat ancestor. But when we do the chip seek, we can see the same factor binds in all the places. And using some molecular biology, we showed that actually this one cut one factor uh, is almost certainly responsible for this. Kind of so that was actually kind of fun. Uh, it, and uh, 
The senior author on this paper, Merlin Crosley, he actually sequenced uh, all of these promoters back in 1993 when he was a postdoc. And so um, we got to kind of wrap the story. So these evolutionary signals. Um, what I would say is assumptions based on the idea uh, that the evolution of transcriptional regulation will be patterns like we are used to in the history of comparative methods are almost certain. Um, and this has implications for how we use model organisms to understand disease. If we know a model organism has a conserved regulatory pathway, it's going to be much more valuable than if, if we know it doesn't have a conserved regulatory pathway. Learning this information will help us use model organisms much better. All right, so the very last thing I want to talk about is mammalian enhancer evolution. Uh, so the mammalian radiation uh, is the most important evolutionary event in our shared history. Uh, and it started with this event. That's uh, an artist uh, impression of the asteroid crater that hit the Yucatan. Uh, and when that happened, all of these wonderful species that had populated the Earth at that point were pretty quickly just wiped out. Uh, and so all the dinosaurs disappeared. And what we had then, after that, was some little proto-mammal, some little fuzzy, skirtly thing that, that managed, to live for, uh, managed to live for however many years that the Earth was dark. And, and all the plants died and all the herbivores died. And so after 66 million years of evolution, actually not a whole lot has changed. Most mammals are still rodents. They still look pretty much the same. Um, but lots of mammals don't look like this. We have gigantic variety of phenotype, and an evolutionary niche in the water and on the land uh, and, and in the air. So, but of course, all of this has happened with a very modest evolution of the protein coding genes. Most of the genes are the same, uh, recognizably the same. And kind of amazingly, actually, is that all of this variety of mammals uh, is actually not all that different than the previous variety that used to be there. So why does evolution do this? Uh, the, the regulatory potential of the, uh, the reptile genome is very different, but the niches are the same. And evolution finds things into niches. So what can we understand about this? So we set out to map active promoters and enhancers across 20 different animals. Some of the species we've looked at before, but others that I'm pretty sure no one has ever done functional genomics in in the past, including dolphin and whale and other things as well. Uh, so this gave us a, a, a stretch of, of mammals to look at. And we see a lot of things, a lot of very interesting things. So we use uh, H3K4 trimethylation as a mark of, uh, as one of our marks, and H3K27 uh, acetylation is the other. H3K27 acetylation in isolation is a mark of, of active enhancers. When these two marks show up together, that's a mark of active promoters. Uh, when H3K4 uh, trimethylation shows up by itself, Actually, we see that pretty rarely, but that may be a mark of a poison promoter. We see situations where they are conserved in every one of the species. We see carnivore-specific events. We see primate-specific events. And no matter how you look at it, you can see interesting specific events. We also see a lot of commonalities. Uh, so if we look across all of these various species, the typical mammalian liver genome uh, has roughly 22,000 enhancers, roughly 12,000 promoters. And this is pretty stable over evolutionary time. Shouldn't be a real surprise. This is close to the number of expressed genes uh, in liver. Uh, this number, I think, is more, uh, more unknown before we start. Uh, but that's, that's basically roughly what we see across all of these species. When we look for the events that are shared, and for a number of technical reasons, we had to limit this to the 10 placental mammals with the highest quality genomes. Otherwise, the multiple alignments just make the, the entire analysis a giant mess. We see this large group of both marks uh, shared, and then a smaller group of about 280 of these uh, uh, H3K27 acetylation. So these are the, in all 20 species, uh, enhancers that are shared. And this leads to around a little more 2,150 uh, placental conserved regulatory elements. There's a couple of very interesting characteristics of these elements. The most interesting one of them is not for these ones that are conserved. It's for the ones that are unique. So in each of these cases, we could look at enhancers that showed up in only one of the species. So it's a species unique. And we call these recently evolved. So recently evolved promoters in only one of the species. Most recently evolved promoters come from young DNA. So it, it's common that they come from repeats of various types. 
Uh, and so these have, have driven these, these new promoters show up from repeats of various types. Uh, and so this is how new promoters look. New enhancers, so recently evolved enhancers, and just one of our species, come from ancestral DNA. DNA that was present, present in a common ancestor of all of these species. Uh, it's much, much more common. And so what evolution has done here is it's repurposed DNA that existed in the common ancestor in species-specific ways to drive tissue-specific regulation. Uh, and I think this is actually a very surprising, at least a surprising result to us. We could do a couple of other things uh, to model how fast things change. So we can model how fast uh, promoters change, how fast enhancers change, and compare that back to how fast CVP alpha changes. Uh, and what we see is that promoters change actually with a half-life that is very close to the genes themselves. So if you look at the change in protein coding genes, it is roughly this sort of half-life. Enhancers are more dynamic, uh, but they're less dynamic than the transcription factor themselves. Again, I think this supports a model of redundancy where enhancer may stay while different transcription factors come in and use that enhancer for evolution. Uh, and, and lastly, so evolution is smart in this regard. Uh, when we looked in these two species, naked mole rat and dolphin, and looked at the genes the authors of the genome papers identified as uh, rapidly evolving, we also saw species-specific enhancers in those situations. So evolution doesn't just use changes in the protein coding gene to get things done. It uses synergistic changes in the regulation to get things done. And this is, a, this is probably obvious. Evolution is going to use whatever's at hand, and it always has. All right, so to wrap up. Uh, enhancers evolve more quickly than promoters, but not as fast as transcription factor binding. The vast majority of the conserved regulatory regions actually contain both of these marks and are active promoters. Uh, and the conserved enhancers, um, the conserved enhancers are usually distal to genes, uh, which I didn't show that data. Uh, but the species-specific enhancers are often created from ancient sequence, so from ancestral sequence. So summarize everything. Uh, comparative regulatory genomics, I hope, I've managed to convince you, is actually a powerful technique to understand how the genome is actually evolving, how it actually works, and how we can identify regions that are functionally conserved by evolution. Functional conservation is probably more important than sequence conservation in the regulatory space. We need to learn how to find it better. Doing all of these experiments in every possible tissue and every possible species is not really feasible. Uh, we showed that DNA binding factors with different roles and different expression patterns evolve differently. I think there's a potential to really deeply understand tissue-specific regulatory biology if we collect the right data in the right situation. TF binding, no matter how we look at it, clearly exhibits rapid but also coordinated evolution. Uh, and enhancers, uh, critically, the new enhancers are Ancient, ancient sequence that has been repurposed by evolution in tissue-specific ways. So the main acknowledgement is, is Duncan Odom's group. This is the evolution of our group over time. Um, and some additional acknowledgements, including the people who pay the bills. And so with that, I'm very happy to take questions. Um, and if there's not too many, we can go right to We have. Um, it is more complicated than that generally. So I, I was under the impression actually when we started comparing these, these transcription factors to, to the gene expression output that we would see the regulation go away and the gene, the gene expression change in some significant way. In general that doesn't happen. Do you think that's related to the uh, uh, Yeah. Paralogs and other redundancy in the genome? That's what I think is, is largely going on. Um, we don't, I mean, as much as, as much as we try to tell a story using a few transcription factors, there's actually many more that are expressed in there. And so we are looking through pretty cloudy windows in this situation. So I, I think redundancy plays a stronger role than, than we understand for keeping, the, uh, keeping the, the gene expression relatively constant over evolution. Now, there are other explanations as well, which is that uh, 
there are various processes that are maybe bringing in different enhancers or, or different looping of the DNA to control the regulation. And so when we look in the same place in sequence space, actually that's not the right place to look. So have you looked at, um, so the three uh, transcription factors you were looking at were generally either there or all lost. Did you just coincidentally pick a group that was coordinated, or do you think there are just different groups that have different coordination? That's a, good, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, so, yeah, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, one thing I can tell you, um, which may shed some light on this, is that when you look at the, the differentially expressed genes in the CBP alpha knockout, the, I think the second most differentially expressed gene is CBP gain. So one of the other members of the CBP, of which there are five. Um, now, what we saw in when we did the CBP alpha knockout is that the clusters tended to fall away, but definitely not all of them. And so what where we don't have the data is with CBP gamma. And would CBP gamma be replacing those, for example, in some of them? Um, or is there something else more complicated going on? So, however, I don't think we just got incredibly lucky and we chose three transcription factors that just happen to behave this way. I, I think this is this is much more likely to be a general and in fact, when we've looked at other factors, the one cut one factor, we've looked at FOXA2 as well, we see, we see all of the same, uh, same characteristics there. So I, I'm, I'm much more comfortable saying that this is a general, this is a general property of the way we made transcription factors. A quick question, how different would the story be if you weren't looking at mammals, but let's say you're looking at crustaceans or Kinoderms or, or. So the story is actually different if you look at, say, or it's apparently different if you look at Drosophila. So Alex Stark's group in, in Vienna has published a number of the papers that have stories like transcription factor binding is highly conserved across species. And, and at one level, this seems very contradictory, but Drosophila has a very different population, uh, population genomics. Their, their, their uh, effective population size is much much higher. They they drive uh, mutations out of their genome that are that are um, detrimental. Where mammals just simply don't have the either the genome space or the the pop effective population size to do either one of those things. Mm -hmm. So I think if we were looking in other species, uh, that that aspect of it, that effective population size, would be important. And in fact, we've, we've tried to come up with um, other models that have similar characteristics of time to last common ancestor, but higher effective population size to test this. But that's been more difficult than the uh, one Yeah, come back. Coming back to the idea of the combinatorial binding effects, if you look at uh, chip seek data, let's say, for many different transcription factors, you kind of see all different combinations. So sometimes you see one factor bound at one site. Sometimes you see other sites where there's 10 things bound. Sometimes you see paired binding of, say, Oct4 Oct and Sox2, which bind together. And sometimes you see them alone. So what how, do you think it's just that we're missing so much information that we're still not seeing that all of those are combinatorial? or? So I, I think the actual explanation is probably it, it's probably more complex and not, maybe not very satisfying. What, uh, although I think there are more functional, meaning they're doing something important, binding sites in the genome than most people give them credit for, I do not believe that every transcription factor binding site in the genome is functional. A lot of them are there because it's opportunistic, because there's a, a certain concentration of transcription factors in the genome, because the chromatin is organized in a certain way, and so you see binding in those situations. Um, what we don't know, and, and so many of these many of these binding sites actually appear to be evolving neutrally. Uh, I don't think that necessarily rules them out from doing something. Uh, but but so when we see some of these these situations. A plausible explanation is that this is opportunistic or noisy binding because there is an X amount of, of factor in the gene. 
But I, I mean, in defense of some of these transcription factor binding sites, though, the standard of proof that most people apply for a transcription of factor binding site to be functional is incredibly high. But you have to mutate it and see a phenotype. So you have to know what it's doing. If we applied that same standard to protein coding genes, we'd only have 10,000 protein coding genes. Because we only know what half of the protein coding genes are doing. So I, I think we should cut some of our transcription factor binding sites a um, and, 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 and And get to know them a little bit better. But some of them, yeah, some of them will be completely uninteresting. They'll just be hanging. Or well, just because we didn't test them doesn't mean okay, we didn't figure out what they do doesn't mean they're not interesting. But that's, that's exactly right. Any other questions? Okay, well, I have one more question. Um, so, you talked about, you know, peaks and hot sites and strong binding sites and so forth. But we actually don't have a really good sense of the dynamics of the binding of these transcription factors, right? I mean, that's a whole level of biochemistry that we haven't really sort of determined affinities and so forth and how it is in the cell and the conditions that they are in the cell. There's a lot of variation there that is sort of totally is missing. I, I, so no, don't trip. That, that, that's I, mean, I made a good point, but don't trip. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 so that's, that, that, that's right. And in fact, one, that's one of the reasons why I think most people simplify the problem by just making it binary. Balance yeah. not binary. Yeah, yeah. And for most comparisons, actually, especially when you're comparing uh, across different antibodies that may have different efficiencies, when you're, or when you're comparing across species, I think you fundamentally have to do that. We, uh, when we had the, the short branch length, with the very closely related mice, mm -hmm. we, we deliberately did that to try to push and look at the changes in intensity. I think the way we've done that is defensible and, and stands up. Um, but as a general rule, making very broad statements about comparing the intensity in species that are, are very different, or com directly comparing intensities for antibodies that don't have the same properties, uh, is a is, is dangerous and is a mistake. So um, it is striking, though, to see when when you see patterns recapitulated of you know relative peak heights uh, over and over, which which suggests that it is not a noisy process. I mean, you can repeat an experiment many times and see a, a differential two peaks at a differential height every single time in, that exper in those experiments. So it means something, but. I'm hesitant to really say. I, I use the term binding affinity because lots of people do. I'm not 100% comfortable with it, but you know, lots of people use the term function to mean all sorts of crazy things. So you know, whatever we can use language. Over. So I just have a question leading up from yeah. that. So when you when you're showing one of the exciting ones with the with the, the close branch like with the limitations that you found that didn't affect the motif were in the majority. And so with the idea of affinity, I was wondering if you could comment what, what you think might be at play there. Is it genetic mutations affecting nucleosome positioning or something outside the motif that could make what should be a very you know, a very attractive site become unattractive in a short evolutionary time? So, so the, way, the way I think about this, which I'm not sure is the right analogy, but the way I think about this is that a given transcription factor binding site is held up by a number of pillars, a, a sort of a foundation. It may have a stronger or weaker foundation. And, and these, these pillars represent chromatin conformation. They may re represent the content of binding partners. They may represent other things. And just like a, a, a well-designed building demolition, if you put the dynamite in the right pillar, you'll take the whole building down. But if you don't, if you just go hit one of the pillars with a hammer, you might weaken it a little bit, but actually you don't change it very much. And so, so how we can test that, I'm not exactly sure. But I think that's what we're seeing, that there's a number of, of different different things that could cause a binding site to be lost. A, a sequence change that causes a, a sequence change that causes some change in the nucleosome position, some change of the binding partner, uh, maybe something else that, uh, that overall weakens uh, or obviously strengthens uh, a given site. So, so that's what I think is going on, but, but that's most of the speculation. Um, so I remember seeing a paper years ago called something like, let's say, we sequence 12 fly genomes. It was comparative. So 
if I was reading that paper, and I don't remember what the author said, but if they said, look, we found all these really strongly conserved cis regulatory modules that or we think they are based on the sequence and the position, we therefore propose those are the most important. Based on what you told me today, I should really take that with a grain of salt. It's really the functional conservation of cis regulatory models, not the sequence conservation. That's, that, am I simplifying it? Or? I, so I, I think. I think that overall statement is correct, but in Drosophila, the, the world may be different because of the, the very large population size. So it, it, when, when the analysis of, say, the 20, 29 mammal genomes was done, really the only binding site that they saw reliably was CTCF, which based on our analysis shouldn't be surprising, especially given its history as a retrotransposer. Um, so, but for something like Drosophila with very high effective population and a very compact genome. I mean, Drosophila yes. packs in nearly 20,000 genes in, in what, 100 and 160. 160 megabases. We pack in that same number in a genome that's, what, 20 times bigger. So we, we naturally have a much, much larger potential space to just throw in kind of messy regulatory a lot of swap. Yeah. Where Drosophila can't afford that. And so Drosophila, if, if, if you think about that example from um, the naked mole rat and the dolphin, where evolution is using both regulatory and, and sequence changes and protein coding amino acid changes, using both regulatory and amino acid changes, it would be plausible to think that Drosophila is using both, but may rely more on amino acid changes uh, comparably to the mammals, because they don't have the regulatory space to sort of throw them out. It would be interesting, and, and this is not, I haven't done that experiment, but it would be interesting to see if, if there is a, you know what, I think that is true. Because when people sequence those Drosophilids, which had an actual last common ancestor 25 million years ago, they claim that it's equivalent to human chicken distance because of the DNDS ratio. And the DNDS ratio is a measure of the non-synonymous protein changes. So even though I'm kind of making this theory up, I, I'm starting to like it, um, which, it, which would be that, that evolution in Drosophila has to use more sequence protein coding amino acid changes relative to mammals to affect evolutionary change, where mammals with their large regulatory space can just use the regulatory, use the regulatory space and keep those proteins roughly the same. That sounds like an experiment to do. Okay. Well, we'll continue uh, questions with uh, so please join me in uh, thank you, Paul, for a great uh, talk where it demonstrates that the collaboration between wet biologists and dry biologists is uh, very important. So thank you very much, Paul.